in Canada. A young Russian woman is found dead in a bathtub, beaten and drowned in her own blood. Men fell victim to her charms, and police find at least three suspects with the means and motive to commit the crime. In New Jersey, a woman disappears without a trace. For years, police trail her husband and search for a mysterious box, the gruesome contents of which may prove his guilt. A victim usually never foresees danger when the perpetrator turns out to be a friend or a lover. Science and microscopic evidence can unmask these killers and find justice for those who are loved to death. In this program, some of the names of the participants have been changed to protect their identity. Toronto, Canada is a gleaming, bustling metropolis, rising high above the shores of Lake Ontario. Each year, thousands of immigrants find homes in this international city. For some, the journey leads only to danger and heartbreak. On January 12, 1995, Mark Milligan and Gilbert Ho arrived at the home of a friend, a 23-year-old woman named Paulina Jorasimov. Paulina had been missing for days, and her friends convinced the building superintendent to let them in. Her door was unlocked. The apartment was neat, clean, and eerily quiet. Gilbert Ho went to check the bedroom, and there he made a shocking discovery. The room was in disarray, the bed spattered with blood. It was a horrific, violent scene. But in the bathroom was something more brutal. In the bathtub lay a woman's body, submerged in bloody water. The skull had been shattered, but they knew it was Paulina. They called police. Police dispatch received a frantic call from Gilbert Ho at 1.40 p.m. Detective Sergeant Ken Taylor of the Toronto Police Homicide Squad was assigned the case with his partner, Detective Sergeant Mike Hamill. The witnesses were asked to give statements at police headquarters. Ken Taylor recalls the scene. When we first arrived at the scene, we took a quick look just to get, get an idea as to what we would be dealing with. The door was open, and uh, as I turned to the left, the bathroom is on the left as you're looking in the apartment. I could see the, uh, a female uh, lying in the bathtub. The door to the... Uh, to the patio or to the balcony was open about six inches. It was a cold night uh, and it had been cold for a number of days so that's why the, the apartment was so cold. Investigators found a dog which they removed from the premises. Detective Sergeant Mike Hamill. The dog, the dog even was eating out of the dog. Whoever did this uh, cared about her dog. There was some water in the, uh, in the dish on the floor as well. And I suspect the uh, balcony door was left open for the dog to go, be able to go outside. That's pretty interesting. Nobody broke in, so that suggests to us as homicide investigators that she knew who the killer was. And that the killer uh, either let himself in or she let the killer in. The bedroom had clearly seen the greatest share of violence. Blood was spattered on pillows, sheets, and up the wall. Though their victim was found in the tub, she was clearly beaten here and savagely. 
Detectives spotted a curious ring of dried blood, which indicated that something had been placed atop the dresser during or after the crime. They later found a cup of the same size in the bathroom. Police theorized that while the killer was cleaning up after the murder, he'd made himself a cup of tea. Whoever it was was comfortable in the apartment, probably knew that nobody else would be coming, and he had plenty of time to clean up. Toronto Police Detective Richard Wisnowski of the Forensic Identification Services was dispatched to the apartment that afternoon. The victim appeared to have been dead for several days. The first thing that I did was to photograph all the rooms in detail and then to start collecting any evidence that might prove useful to the investigation. Under the body in the bathtub, I found a hammer, which was most likely the murder weapon. The detective also observed disinfectant cleanser in the bath. This was a unique crime scene that I have not encountered very often in the fact that there was the brutality of the murder and the condition that the body was left in. Throughout the bathroom, Detective Wisnowski dusted for prints. If it was a stranger to stranger homicide, then fingerprints and any evidence left in the apartment would be very important. In the living room, he collected an answering machine tape which could also help clarify time of death. But it was the signs of violence in the bedroom that seemed the most perplexing. The drawers of the dresser were open and clothes were scattered around, but it appeared that nothing of value was taken. It wasn't a true robbery in the sense what I've experienced in the past. It looks like it was a staged incident, and it was a cover-up for the, the true intention was to commit the murder. At police headquarters, detectives took statements from Paulina's two friends who had discovered her body. Mark Milligan had grown concerned when she wasn't answering her phone so and had missed class there, for several days. Yes. Um, did that today. Paulina, he explained, was an art student at a local university. He was at that apartment because of his concern, because nobody had seen or heard from Paulina for quite some time. He was uh, obvious, it stood right out at us, that he was a friend, um, never a suspect. Gilbert Ho was a boss of Paulina's at a bar where they worked in downtown Toronto. Uh, Mr. Ho uh, was uh, very cooperative with us. Uh, he was, from what I understand, the one who started the sort of search party for Paulina. But unlike Milligan, detectives were not able to cross him off their suspect list. He told police he was having an affair with Paulina. He was paying a uh, bulk of her rent. Um, and it was obvious from what he said that uh, he cared for her very much. Gilbert Ho had last seen Paulina earlier that week on Monday, January 9th. Never seen this one before. I certainly hope so. The two had eaten dinner Hello? and were planning to spend the evening in her apartment hey, when she received a phone call. How are you? Ho explained to detectives that he was not disturbed by the call. You're more than welcome. Paulina was very pretty, and he'd long ago accepted the fact that she had many men in her life. Are you sure? She asked Ho to leave around 1.30 in the morning. Okay, I'll see you later. Right. He assumed she was expecting another guest. In the days that followed, he left several messages on her answering machine, but she never called back. Paulina's body was sent to the office of the chief coroner in Toronto. An autopsy was conducted the day after Paulina was found. Although her body had lain out for days, the pathologist's task was made easier thanks to the bathtub's cool water and the wintry air rushing in from the balcony. Acting Chief Coroner, Dr. Barry McClellan. So in a case like this where the body is found in a cooler environment, that in fact is a benefit to us when it comes to preserving the tissues and conducting the autopsy examination. 
They found ligature marks where she was bound at the wrists and ankles and defensive wounds on her hands and arms. She had an excess of 20 blows to her head uh, and the pathologist at the autopsy felt that the hammer was consistent with the injuries. Doctors believe that Paulina, though severely beaten, was still alive when she was tied up and placed in her bathtub. The cause of death was determined to be blunt force head injuries with possible terminal drowning. Two clues warranted further investigation. Semen found in the body and a human bite mark located on her upper body. Police would have to wait for a final autopsy report. Neighbors confirm that Paulina had several men in her life, including a husband, a man named Ivan Joseph. Joseph was a businessman who had recently moved to Calgary, some 2,000 miles away. He came to Toronto uh, within a couple of days to be interviewed. She was estranged from her husband. Uh, as a matter of fact, they were going through divorce uh, proceedings. He explained that he had last spoken to his wife on Monday evening, shortly before her dinner with Gilbert Ho. During that phone call, she told him that she would be sending him papers that would finalize their divorce. Ivan Joseph had known Paulina in Russia. The two had been high school sweethearts. How are you? He immigrated to Canada in 1990. Paulina followed two years later. Within four months, the two were married, eager to start a new life for themselves in Toronto. The relationship was good at the start, and then she uh, started working. She started getting more confident. Uh, in herself, and they just sort of uh, grew away. Joseph told police Paulina began coming home from work later and later. And the newlyweds began arguing with increasing regularity. Oh, thanks for making dinner. After only three months, the couple separated. Relax. We're supposed to spend time For the last two years, they had lived apart. I don't have time for this. Because, well, where have you been? Ivan Joseph insisted that he and Paulina had remained friends. Who have you been with tonight? I was out with my girlfriends. I had errands to run. Police, however, were suspicious. Her husband was, was in Calgary at the time, but that doesn't mean that he couldn't have arranged uh, something here for her. That nobody heard from her after this particular day was suspicious to us. Detectives now had two suspects to pursue. Gilbert Ho and Ivan Joseph. But with each day, it seemed, their list of possible perpetrators grew. According to friends, Paulina led an active social life and began dating a third man soon after her separation. She moved in with him in the fall of 1992. His name was Ed Casco. The two had an on-again, off-again relationship. After an argument, she eventually moved out in the summer of 94, five months before her death. Detectives were eager to learn more about this man and called him in for questioning. Like their other suspects, Casco was cooperative and seemed affected by Paulina's death. Though she'd left him and moved into the apartment provided by Gilbert Ho, the two still saw each other on occasion. Casco admitted meeting her on Friday, January 6th. He slept with her that night and left the next day. Detectives recalled Gilbert Ho's statement about a late night guest Paulina was expecting. But Casco denied coming over to see her late on Monday night, January 9th, the last day Paulina was seen alive. Police now had to eliminate two of the three suspects. They looked to Paulina's body for clues as to which of the men who loved her killed her.
In 1995, a young Russian woman living in Toronto was found brutally slain. Paulina Gerasimov was struck 20 times in the head with a hammer and left to drown in a bathtub. Three men, all current or former lovers, were under suspicion. Detective Mike Hamill. It's a process of elimination. You, you start off with uh, a number of suspects, but the, the, the quicker you eliminate the, the less important suspects, the more time you will have to focus on your number one suspect. Investigators turned to Ron LeBlanc, hoping to gain a better understanding of their victim. Thanks, sir. LeBlanc was the owner of a Toronto bar where the victim had worked. Gilbert Ho also worked at the bar. And Ed Casco was a customer there. Gilbert Ho was our bar manager at the time. He was so distracted with her in every which way that he grew just progressively inefficient. You're hearing what I'm he started to spiral out of control because he could not concentrate anymore. LeBlanc informed detectives that he had been forced to fire both Gilbert Ho and Paulina Gerasimov in the fall. Their trip to the bar left detectives with more questions than answers. I can't think of any reasons why anyone would want to kill her. She was a fun-loving, uh, easy person. Uh, she got along with everybody. She had no enemies in the world. Detectives hoped her body could point them in the right direction. At the coroner's office, Dr. Robert Wood made a mold of the bite mark on the victim's body, pouring a quick-drying silicon-based cast onto the wound. That is flowed over the skin, uh, and then multiple layers are put on and allowed to set. We use this material in, in conventional dentistry, and it is extremely accurate. The bite mark impression was like a three-dimensional fingerprint with unique characteristics that could ID a killer. The next step was to compare the bite radius of each suspect. Detectives asked each man to come to police headquarters and meet with a dentist. That would, in our opinion at that time, rule these people in, rule them out. Doctors took skin cells for DNA comparison and made models of each man's teeth. Now that can be done by any dentist, but I prefer to do the impressions when I can myself. And that impression making process is essentially identical to anything that anyone would have done in private general dental practice. And we will also just look to see if there are any loose teeth, recently extracted teeth, teeth that have been possibly altered, just to make sure that there hasn't been anything done in order to disguise uh, a dentition. While Wood created his dental molds, forensic biologist Dr. Susan Kern analyzed DNA. When we do the analysis, we have a known sample from uh, the victim. We have a known sample from an accused or suspect. And then we have our unknown sample. We would do the profile for all, all of those samples and then look between them and see where we have similarities and where we have differences. Kern compared samples from each suspect to DNA taken from the semen found in the victim. She examined the DNA provided by Paulina's husband, Ivan Joseph, comparing it to the sample found at the autopsy. After there was no match, she repeated the procedure with Gilbert Ho's DNA sample. Once again, there was no match. A third chart, and the same intricate patterns painstakingly traced. And there it was. Two charts, their patterns in perfect alignment. It was Ed Casco, her longtime boyfriend. The ex-boyfriend seemed to be, at the time of her death, very much involved with her. Casco admitted to police that he and Paulina had quarreled on the phone Sunday, two days after he had last seen her. Results from the dental molds offered detectives another break in the case. Hello, Ken. I'll send along a report. After a meticulous comparison, Dr. Wood okay. relayed his findings to police. 
In bite mark analysis, often we will rule people out as well as rule them in. In this case, two people could be definitely ruled out, and one could not be ruled out. One of the suspects that Dr. Wood ruled out was Ed Casco. In 1995, Toronto police investigating the brutal death of a young Russian woman had narrowed their field of suspects to two. DNA evidence proved that Paulina Gerasimov had sexual relations with one man before her death. The man was Ed Casco, her former boyfriend. Teeth specialist Dr. Robert Wood had ruled out Ed Casco as a suspect. But violent bite marks on the victim matched another suspect, Gilbert Ho. But we needed something more that would, that would link Mr. Ho to the actual murder, to the body. Financial records strengthened their case. Ho, who'd been fired from his job, was still paying Paulina's rent. Unemployed, he'd been bouncing checks for months. Right there, please. Yeah, you're okay. Hi. Yeah, you're a member of the detective. So he came down to uh, to the division, and uh, we began interviewing him. Okay. We told him, as a matter of fact, that we believed our us as investigators believed you, Mr. Ho, killed Paulina. Detectives began their questioning by playing messages from the answering machine tape found in Paulina's apartment. The day after her murder, Ho had left several messages. Despite knowing the rent was not paid and she was to be evicted from the apartment, he spoke of getting together with her and buying her groceries. He makes several phone calls to her on her answering machine, probably to try and put us off because he calls, hi, princess, it's Tuesday, uh, where have you been? I miss you. Police believed that Ho expected Paulina's body would be found that day by police officers coming to evict her. But they never showed up. He knew that Paulina's body was in the bathtub. Ho also knew he had no money and had not paid rent on the apartment in months. Detectives confronted him with the state of his finances and asked him to explain the strange contradictions in his story. But he could not. They moved on to a more incriminating piece of evidence, the bite mark. Again, he had no explanation and denied having committed the act. The final autopsy report provided the final piece of the puzzle. Stomach contents found at autopsy indicated that the victim had died about one hour after eating dinner on Monday, January 9th. It's our belief as a result of the uh, stomach contents that she was killed sometime around her supper time. The uh, dinner that she was going to have was consistent with what we found at autopsy. And those kind of things, they don't lie. That's fact. That's evidence. She has broccoli, full piece of broccoli in her stomach. She has a full piece of carrot in her stomach. That's evidence. That doesn't go away. So couple that with Mr. Ho's statement from, that he was with her and nobody else was with her from 1.30 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. It was obvious to me that Mr. Ho killed Paulina. There remained one unanswered question. If Ho killed Paulina, then how could Ed Casco's semen still be inside the victim? Dr. Susan Kern turned to semen viability studies for answers. Semen can be typed up to approximately seven days. This case, the samples were collected additional days after that, and that would have been due to the fact that her body was in a very cold environment. The case occurred in the winter. The door was open. The washroom would be cold where she was found, and the temperature would be number one in slowing down any decomposition of the biological material. Okay, Mr. Detectives finally had their man. Okay, 
Gilbert Ho was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. According to the landlord, Ho had been informed that his tenant would be evicted on January 10th. Police theorized that he never told Paulina, hoping to maintain her affections as long as possible. It was a strategy doomed to failure. Ho had run through his savings. On January 9th, with only hours to go before her eviction, Ho showed up at the apartment. For one last night. It's my position that she had no idea that morning that she was going to be evicted because nothing was packed. If she knew she was going to be evicted, you would have thought she's a responsible girl. She would have packed a bag. She wouldn't have just allowed the sheriff to come in, throw everything in garbage bags, and throw it out on the street. Poe did not leave the apartment as he testified to police and Paulina was expecting no late-night guest. Gilbert Ho was the last man who saw her alive. Ho knew that that was the day, that particular day that he killed her, she had to be out the next morning. So he had no choice, that was the night, because he couldn't afford to continue on with this type of lifestyle with her. On June 21st, 1996, Gilbert Ho was convicted of the murder of Paulina Gerasima. He was sentenced to life in prison. The corpse at a crime scene often speaks loudest, offering up clues to a killer. But a murder case is made even tougher when there is no body or crime scene at all. October 2nd, 1991. Deanna Weiss was anxious. Her mother, Fran Smith, should have been home. But for days, she'd called and gotten no answer. Finally, a response. Yeah. It was John David Smith, her mother's second husband. And what he said shocked her. Smith did not know where her mother was. He thought she had gone to visit her. Smith felt sure she was overreacting when she insisted he contact police. He reluctantly agreed. Smith arrived at police headquarters in West Windsor, New Jersey, to file a missing persons report. He told the officer a couple of days before he had arrived home from work only to find a note left by his wife. It told him to feed the fish that she would be back in a few days. Confused, he tossed the note in the trash. They'd been married a year and a half. Though she'd recently talked about wanting to travel, this was, for Fran, unusual behavior. Days turned to weeks, and there was still no sign of her. Deanna, Fran's daughter from a previous marriage, arrived in town highly alarmed, as did Fran's sister, Sherry Gladden Davis. We are. Uh handed out flyers and we talked to people all up and down the street where Fran worked. There is no way that Fran would have gone any place without Dee Dee or I one knowing where she was. The women suspected that Fran's husband had not told the whole story. Local police also had their suspicions. Bob Hilland recalls the case. I first learned of her disappearance while I was in uniform patrol and back in uh, the fall of 91. 
During roll call, we learned that uh, a woman in our town named Fran Smith was missing and to be on the lookout for her. According to friends and relatives, Fran was a friendly, stable woman who worked as an executive secretary. Her husband was, by all accounts, a quiet, hard-working engineer with a penchant for sports cars. Lead detective Mike Dansbury interviewed Smith several times in the months following the disappearance. Each time, he was left with more questions than answers. There were a lot of inconsistencies in the initial report that John had provided to the police. Uh, number one, Betty Fran was incapacitated. A month before she vanished, Fran slipped and broke her hip. She was recovering at home. Uh, here was a woman who couldn't walk out of her, her own house or downstairs without the assistance of crutches or a walker. She couldn't drive a car. She didn't have any money. And all of a sudden, she vanishes off the face of Earth, and nobody knows where she is. Fran's sister, Sherry, learned from police that Smith had been married before to a woman named Janice Hartman. She began combing phone books from towns and cities where Smith had lived. After dialing yes, countless numbers, Sherry located Janice's brother. I said, um, what's this about? And uh, I said, I understand your sister was married to John Smith. And he said, yes. And I said, well, so was my sister. And she's missing. His response was shattering. Um, my sister's been missing since yes. November of 1974. New Jersey detectives immediately contacted the police in Worcester, Ohio, where the earlier disappearance occurred. Detectives hunted out the old case files and found it bore a striking resemblance to the current mystery. Seventeen years before his second wife went missing, John Smith was the prime suspect in the disappearance of his first wife. She vanished days after their divorce became final. Her family blamed Smith, but prosecutors had no proof, and he eventually left the state. The woman's body was never found. Law enforcement's attentions were raised significantly when it was learned uh, that John had been married to another woman in Ohio, that would be Janice Hartman Smith, in 1974, and she had disappeared under very similar circumstances. Then everybody became very concerned. What are we, what are we dealing with here? More than a decade earlier, the Janice Hartman Smith case had gone cold. Now, detectives had the Fran Smith case, and once again, the trail had gone cold. For more than two decades, suspected murderer John David Smith had baffled authorities. First in Ohio in 1974, and then in New Jersey in the 1990s. By 1997, the FBI's cold case squad, based in New York City, was eager to take a crack at him. Leading the new investigation was Bob Hilland, the former New Jersey patrolman, now an FBI agent, dedicated to solving unsolved crimes. I knew how frustrating it was back in 91, 92, because there was a lot of work put into that case. Smith's wives had a habit of disappearing, as did Smith, who skipped town once the local authorities gave up the chase. He was transient by nature. We didn't really know where he was. Finding a man named John Smith, the right John Smith, would not be easy. We kind of had to start from scratch as far as going back and generating a timeline of places he had been, places he had lived, places he had worked, people whom he had known. Hilland tracked down a longtime girlfriend of Smith's in Connecticut. Stubborn at first, she eventually revealed his location, California. Agents located Smith in San Diego and kept him under surveillance. He was working for a custom car manufacturer they discovered he'd maintained his fondness for sports cars and spouses. 
Smith had married a third time, and agents were concerned that she would become another victim. In 1998, Bob Hilland led a task force meeting at FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. The plan to take down John David Smith once and for all. In the previous investigations, when John was brought in by law enforcement and interviewed, his immediate cause of action when he left the police station, he would go to his family, his friends, anybody that knew him, and he'd say, listen, the police are probably going to come talk to you. If they talk to you, don't say anything. Don't, don't even speak to them. And he would kind of give them a heads up. So the strategy here was, let's identify everybody in John's life uh, from as far back as 1974 to present day, people who we felt uh, potentially had information or could offer assistance in this case. Then we're going to go out and interview everybody simultaneously. It took nearly six months to coordinate the operation, utilizing scores of agents. On May 5th, 1999, everyone was in position. And at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, the takedown began in San Diego. John David Smith? Yes. The Midwest. Hey, man, how you doing? And the East Coast. Gathering up relatives, friends, neighbors, anyone who possibly had information that could help solve the mystery of the two missing women or prevent the disappearance of even more. It was just a matter of time. No question in my mind about it. FBI agent Bob Hilland led the siege, coming face to face with John David Smith outside his office in San Diego. Hilland interviewed Smith in a nearby hotel room. You should recognize At first, people. he cooperated. They've been telling us some things that you haven't been told. With John, it's like playing cards. He wants to see what the cards law enforcement are holding so he can kind of strategize his next move. They showed Smith photos of the friends and relatives who were also being interrogated at the same time. We had a command post set up, and the other interviewers from around the country, as they were getting uh, significant information from their interviews, they would call it into us. I feel very responsible for what happened. We made it clear to John that uh, this interview and, and his interaction with law enforcement was different than any in the past. Now he was dealing with the FBI and the resources of the FBI. I'm down. We got a couple more questions. After eight hours, Smith showed signs of weakening. Have to lay down for a little bit. He started crying. Um, and he curled up in a ball. He wrapped himself up in a fetal position, just crying. And he said, I want to cover myself with a blanket. I want the world to go away. Your information, please. Uh, yeah. The FBI had better luck with John's brother, Frank, who was interrogated back in Ohio. Uncooperative at first, the younger sibling eventually gave in and provided investigators with their strongest lead yet. In November of 1974, just days after Janice Hartman's disappearance, Frank had come across his brother in their grandfather's garage. Prosecutor Jocelyn Stefanson. He had asked him what was happening. Uh, and. John told him, I'm building a box to store some of Jan's clothes. He said John sort of got upset about the discussion over the box, so he left. Uh, later that evening, he returned to the garage. And he said it was just weird to him because he'd never seen anyone pack clothing in that manner before. According to Frank, the box then stayed in the garage, unopened, for years. Then, in 1979, while the garage was being cleaned out, Frank and his grandfather opened the box. At first, he thought it was some rags. A closer inspection, however, revealed kneecaps, severed limbs, a partially decomposed skull. There was also jewelry, including a gold chain with a crucifix. Frank recognized them as belonging to Janice Hartman. His statement to us was, I couldn't do anything for the person in the box, but I was going to protect my grandma. And so he did not call the police. He instead placed a phone call to his brother. 
John's response was, I'll be right there. John drove over to the house, put the box into the front seat of his Corvette, and drove away. That was the last ever seen of it. His testimony was valuable, but did not assure a slam dunk case. Frank's grandfather was long dead. No one could confirm the tale. We had no body, we had no crime scene. Uh, and although you can prosecute a no-body homicide case, which is something I was willing to do, it's very difficult. The FBI searched the property in the area that had once been owned by John Smith or his family. They found no box. I know that box exists, now we gotta find the box. How do we find the box? It's a proverbial needle in a haystack. Time was running out. With each passing year, the body, wherever it lay, was decomposing. And evidence that could put John David Smith away for murder was literally turning to dust. In February 2000, FBI officials suspected John David Smith of murder and believed a mysterious box could prove it. In search of the box, Ohio detectives drafted a memo and sent it to law enforcement agencies across the state and neighboring counties in Indiana and Michigan. It was a desperate gambit. Made of plywood and crudely constructed, the box had last been seen in 1979. The chances that it had been found, preserved, and still contained the remains of Smith's first wife were slim indeed. For detectives in Newton County, Indiana, however, the memo triggered a memory. He immediately calls the Wayne County Sheriff's Office and says, uh, uh, Brian, I think I've got your girl. One detective recalled a case from 1980 when he was a young deputy sheriff. A road crew working on a rural county highway had discovered a plywood box. Inside the box, the dismembered remains of a female body. Look at the this. body was never identified. Locals around town merely called her the lady in the box. Just by good luck, they still had all the original evidence uh, still in evidence storage. They had the box, they had the contents, they had her, her jewelry, her crucifix, everything described in the box they had. They had buried her remains in a, in a Jane Doe grave, so she was out in a cemetery. Um, the next step was we have to go to the cemetery and exhume her body. It was March 3rd, 2000. More than two and a half decades of police work had come down to this moment. Now we had a body. We were hoping that we would be able to determine how she died. Uh, which is something that's always helpful in any murder case. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we had the right body. The bones were examined by Dr. Frank Saul, a forensic anthropologist at the Lucas County Coroner's Office. The skeletal remains uh, were in surprisingly good condition. The elements of the pelvis that told us that she was a female. We then examined the bones directly and radiographically and determined that although she was mature, she was young mature. And we told the agents and the detectives that she was probably in her 20s. The description matched that of Janice Hartman, who was 23 when she went missing. The cause of death was unknown, though it was clear her legs had been severed just below the knee. We had just the upper portions of the tibia and fibula. The lower portion of the lower leg, including the ankle portion and the foot on both sides, was missing and never found. The severed bones were sent on to Dr. Stephen Symes, a forensic anthropologist who specializes in dismemberment. 
a close examination revealed telltale striations and cut marks. There's no patterning, no uniformity, nothing. It's, they're going every which direction. The cuts were made by hand with a blade that had a serrated edge and 10 teeth per inch. A typical carpenter saw that you use to cut a two by four. Usually has fewer teeth in it. They're a little bit bigger than that. They're uh, six, seven teeth per inch, for example. But uh, 10 teeth per inch would be like a big bread knife or something like that that you've got at home. It's a very strange thing to find. A serrated knife is very difficult to cut bone with. I would think it would take a lot of persistence. John had said, if I can't have her, nobody's going to have her, and she'll never walk away from me. So the, uh, the thought has been discussed that by cutting her legs off, um, she will physically never walk away from him again. The final step was DNA analysis at the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. Genetic material extracted from the bones was compared to a sample donated by Hartman's mother. Both samples shared the same DNA sequence. Finally, they had scientific proof. The lady in the box was Janice Hartman. On October 3rd, 2000, John David Smith was arrested in San Diego. Faced with irrefutable evidence in his first wife's murder, investigators hoped Smith would confess to killing his second wife and reveal the location of Fran's body. But Smith refused to talk. Police theorized that Smith murdered Janice and then cut off her legs so she would fit inside the box he'd made. I don't know what bothers me more, the fact that he cut her legs off or the fact that he kept her dismembered body for five years in his grandparents' house. John's brother, Frank, received immunity for his testimony. This secret nearly destroyed him. He told us that he had had a nightmare of Janice chasing him. Uh, and actually striking him with her legs, uh, the legs that had been um, cut off below the knee. Although he kept silent for 25 years, there was a high personal price for that silence. Police can only guess at the number of women Smith may have murdered. FBI agent Bob Hillen recalls the photo of a woman found in one of Smith's storage lockers and the fragments of teeth buried beneath a house. He maintained photos of, of women and people he had known through the years. And for the most part, we knew all of them, all of them. But uh, there's one that's outstanding. We don't know who this person is. We don't know if she's a former girlfriend, former wife. We don't know if she's alive or if she's dead. On July 18, 2001, John David Smith was convicted for the murder of Janice Hartman. He was sentenced to 15 years to life. If charged in New Jersey with the murder of Fran Smith, he will be eligible for the death penalty. Her case is still open. Her whereabouts remain unknown. After more than 25 years, Janice Hartman was finally laid to rest in Ohio. The family of Fran Gladden Smith hopes they won't have to wait that long. A victim often has no warning when a loved one turns predator and the game is murder. But with the aid of microscopes, computers, and dogged police work, investigators can bring to justice those loved to death.